All right. Thank you for coming. I'm James Shore, as, as Tom mentioned. Uh, I wrote a book called The Art of Agile Development. I have been involved with uh, practicing and teaching Agile since 1999, so it's a little over 20 years. I started in September of 1999. And um, along the way, I co-authored this book, Art of Agile Development, and I co-created the Agile Fluency Model with Diana Larson. If you're familiar with the Agile Fluency Model, in this talk, we're going to be looking at the skills needed to be fluent in the delivering zone of uh, fluency. Now, back in the 90s, when I first got, got started with software development, uh, testing was the job of the QA department. Uh, we had this idea that we, of the validation V. Anybody remember that? Yeah, so we'd create the requirement specification, hand it off to the testing department. They would create a test plan, and then much, much later, they would run that test plan. We'd create a design document. There would be a design test plan. We'd create, and so forth. And there was the validation V. Testing was largely manual. Uh, there was test scripts, but they were created by test leads for the armies of testers to run through them manually over and over and over again. The idea of developer testing didn't really exist at that point. I mean, yeah, I'm a programmer. Uh, we did test our software, believe it or not. We did test it. But we tested it by running it and sort of playing with it. And then the, the, the feeling was, and then the QA folks will take care of it. But of course, what happened? Developers were late. Whose fault is that? Testers. So we're going to cut the testers' time. Yeah, of course it's the tester's fault, right? Who, else is, who else's fault is going to be? And then in 1994, Kent Beck created SUnit. Not to be confused with Sunit Jodhav, Mr. India, uh, 2017, uh, who coincidentally is who you find if you search SUnit on Google. Uh, so Kent Beck released SUnit in 19, uh, 1994. And not much happened. SUnit was written for Smalltalk. Smalltalk wasn't all that popular, even in the 90s. And so it sort of was ignored. But then Kent Beck and Eric Gamma, who is one of the creators of the Design Patterns book, and also was part of the Eclipse Foundation, which is the, the still popular Java IDE, they were on an airplane together. They were flying from Zurich to Atlanta to go to the OOPSLA conference, Object-Oriented Programming Lang Systems, Languages, and Applications conference. And they were sitting next to each other and talking about this idea of automated testing. And uh, Eric Gamma was interested in that. And Kent said, hey, I've created this thing called SUnit. And they got to talking about it. And on that plane ride, they re-implemented it in Java. That was JUnit. This is JUnit in my office in 2001. Uh, the chicken is what makes it work, because we all know tests can be kind of flaky. So whenever the test didn't work, we'd voodoo chicken the keyboard, and then the test would run. <laughs> That's why it's a green bar, because of the chicken. Now, JUnit and developer testing in general didn't really take off until the late 90s, early 2000s which is when extreme programming came along. Now, you don't hear much about extreme programming anymore, but in the early 2000s, it was kind of a big deal. It was such a big deal that major national syndicated cartoonists were making cartoons about it. It was the first really popular Agile method. And a lot of what we take for granted in Agile actually originated in XP. User stories came from extreme programming. Continuous integration came from extreme programming. And automated developer testing. Now, Kent Beck didn't invent automated developer testing, but he did bring it into the mainstream. What's interesting about XP is that the teams that used it fully had really low defect rates. And don't hate me for saying this, they didn't have testers on the teams. In fact, some of the folks who read the original XP books got the impression that uh, I talked to somebody just yesterday at the party last night. Uh, she told me, oh yeah, XP, they hated QA. It's like, well, no, I don't think so. But 
testing and uh, testers were kind of downplayed and seen as sort of obsolete in this movement, and I apologize for that. But uh, that's not the point of this talk. Uh, what I want to tell you about is how these teams got such good results. Nancy van Schoendervoort, uh, she had a team that did XP at a large, uh, large farm equipment manufacturer, a name that you've almost certainly heard of. And uh, she wanted to do XP at that company, and they kind of were like, eh, I don't really want to do it. It's sort of a traditional you know, organization. They do embedded software for their, for their farm equipment. She wanted to do XP. She kept pushing and kept pushing and kept pushing, and they said, okay, fine. We'll let you do XP, but here, have, have these folks that aren't doing anything else. So she ended up with a team of four people who had never done embedded systems before, never done C programming, uh, embedded C before, never done real-time systems before, uh, never done multiprocessing systems before, and of course these are all things that they had to do to build this embedded system for a farm combine. Over the next three years, they produced 60,000 lines of embedded C code. Uh, they actually shipped their first version after a year and a half, and then they supported it uh, and did other things and helped other teams over the next year and a half. Now, Capers Jones uh, says that a system of this size and in this environment, using this language in this industry, with 60,000 lines of code, a best in class team is going to produce 460 defects. No offense to Nancy's team, I don't, they were probably not a best in class team. They were new at a lot of this stuff. But they were using extreme programming. So, how did they do? Well, over the course of those three years, they built 51 defects. They found just under 60% of them and shipped, I think, 23 defects to their customer. Maybe it was 21. Which is actually about the same as what you'd expect from a best in class team, which will write 460 defects, according to Capers Jones, find 95% of them, and ship 23 to their, to their customers. They, never, they averaged one and a half defects per month. They never had more than two defects in their backlog. Michael Ma of uh, QSM Associates, who has actually spoken at this conference, he was a keynote speaker here last year, and in 2010 he gave a talk about some of his findings. QSM Associates does a lot of software measure, uh, team measurement. And this slide is from his 2010 talk. Uh, what they found was that this particular team, this is an XP team, had half to a third of the number of defects of the industry average. Here's another slide from Michael Ma. Uh, this is, uh, compares three XP projects versus two traditional projects at the same company. Uh, this one right here, nearly 100,000 lines of code, 20 defects. So Nancy's results, although they're impressive, they're fairly typical for an XP team. Now here's the thing. This company that Michael Ma studied, I worked there. Uh, Gunjan and Doshi and I were the two coaches for that company. We were brought in by Industrial Logic and the Cutter Consortium. We are the ones who taught them XP. So I know exactly what they were doing on these projects. And that's what I want to talk to you about, is how did these company, how did these teams, how did these XP teams get such good results when they did not have testers on the team? Now, I'm not trying to say there's no place for testers or QA in an Agile environment. Actually, there's a very important place for testers in an Agile environment. But of course, I'm going to save that for the end, because we just learned that the most important information has to come at the end. But don't worry. Don't, you might be feeling a little, what, emotional? That's all right. OK. So, uh, oh, and here's, here's the team the, that I worked with there. You can see my trademark rubber chicken there on the left. So we can think of defects as coming into a uh, software product in four ways. I'm sure there are other ways of thinking about it, but this way is mine. Uh, so one way in which errors can come in is, or defects can be introduced, is programmers make a mistake. They do the wrong thing. So, uh, 
you know, they've got an idea of what needs to be done, they're correct, but they just make a bug, they, they make a mistake. You can also have designs that are prone to error. Uh, Barry Beam says that 20% of the modules in a system have 80% of the errors. Some parts of the system are just error prone, and uh, those, I call those defect prone designs. You can have programmers who understand exactly what, uh, they program exactly what they intended to perfectly, but what they intended to do was wrong in some way. They misunderstand what needs to be done. Or you can have blind spots across the entire organization or the entire team. They're just something that could be a problem that people don't know about. So four different ways uh, that defects can be introduced. We're going to look at each of these in turn and the way XP teams prevented these sorts of defects from happening. Now, I'm not going to stop for questions at the end. I'm going to take questions as we go. So if any, at any point, if you have a question, just raise your hand. I've, I've got some time built in this talk for questions. I'll toss the, uh, I'll toss the box to you, and uh, we can take questions. Now, the first line of defense in XP is test-driven development. Uh, test-driven development is probably the most popular thing, uh, the most successful idea from XP that is still practiced today, uh, along with perhaps continuous integration. Now, everybody thinks that they understand TDD, but I find that they often don't. So before we continue further, I want to play a little game. So find somebody that you're sitting close to. You might have to move around a little bit because we're kind of spread out here. Uh, find somebody to talk to. And one of you is going to pick a number between 1 and 100. And you're all testers, so I have to tell you, it's a whole number between 1 and 100. Yeah. Uh, and then the other person make four guesses of what that number might be, 20, 30, 40, uh, 65. And then the first person thinks to themselves, well, my number was 42, and says, three of your guesses were low, one of your guesses was high. And then you're going to repeat that until you get to the number. Now, when you make your guesses of four numbers, make sure they're at least five digits apart. I'll give you a couple of minutes for this. And now, while we're playing this game, we're going to pass out some handouts for another game we're going to play later on. Uh, keep these handouts secret because uh, we, don't want each we don't want people to see each other's uh, handouts here. All right, so go ahead and uh, try this exercise. Okay, hopefully at this point you've had a chance to do this uh, at least once with uh, your partner, if not, uh, if not both of you. So remember that experience for a moment, set that aside, and now we're going to play this game again, uh, but probably uh, won't take quite as much time for the second time. This time you're going to do the same thing. First person's going to think of a number between 1 and 100, whole number, of course. Uh, you, the other person is going to make one guess, and you're going to tell them if it's high, low, or right on. You're going to repeat until you get the number, uh, and then switch. So go ahead and give you, do that. I'll just give you a couple of minutes for this. Okay, so how are those two experiences different? I'm not going to toss that. Just yell it out. I'll repeat it for the microphone. How were how those two experiences different? Immediate feedback. Immediate feedback. Uh, was it faster the second time? Was it, so yes, people say. Uh, was it easier the second time? Yeah. yeah. Uh, why was that? Now, this, for this one, I will toss the box. Uh, oh, heads up. <laughs> Incomplete. Broken up by the defender. Um, because it was a binary search. It was a binary search. Well, both were a binary search, weren't they? Um, one with a whole bunch of guesses in it. I don't know how you. Yeah, one had a pool of guesses. So. Uh, why was it easier the second time? If they were both binary searches or sort of modified. Here, go ahead and toss that back here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is why we have a volunteer. Thank you, Timothy. <laughs> uh, so could you repeat what you said into the box? So you only had to re remember one thing at a time. Yeah, I only had to re remember one thing. You got feedback a lot faster, too, didn't you? Yeah. That's what test-driven development is. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say with the first one, um, there was needless information put in. Because at a certain point in time, I knew that it was going to be between 25 and 30. But I had to guess, what was it, four different numbers. Yeah. So I know it's going to be somewhere between 20, 
20 and 25 or whatever, but I had to guess 21, 26, 31. I was entering in four bits of information every time, and it was extra yeah, needless. So, so stuff, uh, stuff getting in the way, distracting you, this never happens in software development. No. Never. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so test-driven development is a way of speeding up feedback and focusing you on one thing at a time. Rather than making four guesses or 40, we do one thing at a time and we get immediate feedback. And this is called red-green refactor. Uh, so here's how it works. First thing you do is, well, think. <laughs> That's uh, maybe a surprise to you, but uh, yeah, we, we do try to think when we're programming. Uh, now normally when you're doing software development, what you do is you take the big problem and you think, what do I want to work on next? And you break down that problem until it's small enough that you can work on it. And then you go program that thing and then you'll do some sort of little manual testing around it. Uh, that's sort of the traditional approach to programming. In test-driven development, we do the same thing. We take the big idea and we make it smaller and then we think of a smaller piece and a smaller piece and a smaller piece and still smaller until we can break it down into about the next less than five lines of code. What are less than five lines of code that we can write next? And rather than going and writing those five lines of code or four lines of code or three lines of code, we then think, what test can I write that will fail only until exactly those few lines of code are written? And then pass once those lines of code are written. And once we have that figured out, and this is the hardest part of test-driven development, is figuring out how to take these small steps. Once we have that figured out, then we write the test, and we make a prediction. I have written this test, which is typically also less than five lines of code, and it is going to fail in this way. And then we run the test, and if it doesn't fail, we make one hypothesis, if it does not fail in exactly that way, we're no longer in control of our code. We don't know what's going on. We stop, we go back, and we fix it. Usually the problem is obvious because it's only a couple lines of code. Uh, if it's not obvious, rather than waste time debugging, typically we will undo, 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 and do it again, maybe with a smaller step. Once we have a test failing for the right reason, then we write the production code to make it pass. Again, this is less than five lines of code. Usually it passes right away. But if it doesn't, we're no longer in control. We've made a hypothesis. I've written the test. I've written the production code. It's going to pass. Oh, it didn't pass. OK, well, let me back up and try again. And again, uh, not a lot of debugging here because we're taking really small steps. If it didn't work, it's either obvious by inspection or we took too big of a step. We back up and we try again with a smaller step. At this point, we have now ratcheted the code forward one notch. We've driven our code forward one nat notch, uh, typically taking the simplest, dumbest code that we can think of. Now we look at this and say, how can I make the code better? How can we make it better? And we refactor. We change the design of the code without changing its behavior. And we continue that until the code is as good as we can think of right now or as good as we want it to be right now. And then we repeat over again. This is a very small series of steps. Uh, thinking takes a long time. It uh, takes a lot of work. The refactoring can take uh, a long time, but each individual refactoring step is small. And writing the test, writing the code are small. It is a very short series of validated hypotheses. Uh, done fairly quickly. The, the red and green steps tend to be about 30 seconds each. Now I'm going to play a video, and as I play this video, I want you to look for times when I'm making a prediction. This is an example of real test-driven development. I want you to notice when I'm making a prediction that is then tested immediately. And when you see that happen, raise your hand. The actual, what's being developed here, not important, don't worry about it. Just listen for those predictions and look for when they are immediately tested. I think if we're talking about parsing out an object with a rank, I'm thinking we're going to want to make a card object. 
So our expected value is going to be a card with a particular rank. Let's say 3. Now, that's going to fail because card doesn't exist. Let's watch it fail. It does. Easy to make pass. We'll require it. That will fail because there is no module card. Then we'll make it. And that will fail because there's no constructor. And then we'll make the class. And now it has a constructor. And I expect that will now pass tests. So that video was one minute and two seconds long. How many tested hypotheses did you hear? Yeah, there were four tested hypotheses. Every time the bell rang, which, because I'm like Pavlov's dog, I programmed my build script to make a bell ring every time I run the, run the build. And either it goes, blue if I fail the test, or blee if the test passed. So every time the bell rang, that was a tested hypothesis. One minute and two seconds, four hypotheses checked every 15 seconds on average. Some people think TDD is just another way of writing tests, but it's not. I mean, you do get the tests, and that's useful. And it does force you to think about design, and that's also really important. Um, but more than writing tests, more than using the test to force you to think about the design, TDD is a fundamentally different way of engaging with your code that's really, really detail-oriented and constantly giving you feedback in very, very small steps about whether you are doing what you think you are doing. And because we've got those really small steps, that really high speed, really frequent feedback, we don't have to make four guesses at a time. We don't have to make 40 guesses at a time. We make one guess at a time, and we check it. And it allows us to program what we intend to much easier and faster, because we don't have to do so much careful thinking in advance. Now, because TDD works in much, such small steps uh, and gives you such frequent feedback, the tests have to be fast. Uh, you notice in this example, the tests were basically instantaneous. Uh, that's because it's a really small example. Now, in real production code, uh, you have to take steps to make the test that fast. Ideal is less than a second. Uh, you need the test to run, at least the part of the system that you're working on, in less than five seconds. If it takes more than five seconds, it starts to be a pain in the butt. If it takes more than 10 seconds, then you will not take small steps. You will batch your work up, and now you're making four guesses, not one. And so it doesn't work so well. So people using XP paid a lot of attention to test speed. Now, uh, for programmer testing, you can divide your tests up into three different types. There's lots of different ways of dividing up your tests. But for the sake of this talk, let's say you can divide them up into three types. Uh, you've got end-to-end -end tests. Start at the user interface or just below it, go through the entire system to the back end, does something, comes back. We're going to call that a database. Maybe it's third-party microservices. But whatever it is, it goes through the entire system. These tests are really slow. Uh, they can take minutes to run, or if not, tens of seconds. And they tend to be really fragile and brittle. Next is focused integration tests. We cut out the UI and most of the logic and just test the part of the code that interfaces with an external system. So it's an integration test focused on one piece of integration. Uh, these are faster than end-to-end -end tests, quite a bit faster. You usually can run about uh, 10 to 20 per second. Uh, but obviously, that, you can't have too many of those before you get beyond that one second target or the five second target. So we also have unit tests where we cut out absolutely everything except for the logic of the application. And uh, those run at a rate of hundreds per second. Uh, they are harder to think about, though. They're a little harder to conceive, uh, which is why uh, people don't always write unit tests. But because in XP we care really deeply about fast tests, we follow the test pyramid. You've probably heard of the test pyramid. We want the vast majority of our tests to be the unit tests because those are fast. We're going to have those in proportion to the amount of code that we have. Uh, we're going to have some integration tests because we do have to test that we interact with the outside world. 
in a way, in some way, but they're going to be focused integration tests, and we're going to keep them proportional to the number of outside systems we have. And then we will have just a sprinkling of end-to-end -end tests as a safety net. But my belief is, is that if my end-to-end -end tests fail, that means I've missed something in the rest of my tests. This is what teams that are doing TDD really well do. If you're not doing this, there's something wrong with your testing strategy if you're trying to do TDD and get that frequent feedback. That said, there are a lot of teams out there that have something wrong with their testing strategy. And their tests look more like the test ice cream cone, which I can't take credit for. It came from Alistair Scott. And this is where you've got end-to-end -end tests for absolutely everything. They take hours to run. They fail randomly. Maybe you have an automated system to automatically rerun the tests when they fail. And uh, there's some unit tests sort of sprinkled in there because you've heard they're good. Right. How many of you are in an environment like this and willing to admit it? Yeah. Uh, I'll bet you there's some people who are in this environment and didn't feel comfortable raising their hand. Majority of folks are actually in this sort of environment. We don't have time for me today to talk about how to, to move from the test ice cream cone to the test pyramid, but uh, this is the focus of my workshop on Wednesday afternoon. I'll be talking about how to achieve this test pyramid. Now, it's only a half day workshop, so getting from here to there is even too big for that. If you'd like to know more about that topic, come, come talk to me. So that's test-driven development. It's a way of getting rapid feedback about your, what you're working on so that you build what you intend to build. Now, and, and so that uh, programmers stay in control over the code and, and, uh, and don't make as many programmer errors. Now, in addition, XP teams used pair programming, or these days, mob programming. And uh, they also have a policy of not overworking. It used to be called 40-hour week, but that wasn't very international, so now it's called energized work. What we want is for programmers to be rested and uh, alert so we don't work a lot of overtime and we make sure that we're in an environment where people can pay attention. Because people who are tired make mistakes. The pairing and the mobbing are introduced because nobody is 100% all the time. XP is a very pragmatic approach to software development. We do not expect perfection from humans. We know that we cannot expect perfection from humans. So what do we do? We have the pairing, the continuous code review, or the mobbing, which is another form of continuous code review, so that if you make a mistake, some, there's a better chance that somebody will catch it. Also, uh, XP takes a lot of self-discipline. So it's less likely that two people are going to, as one person said, let loose their inner pig at the same time. And both say, if one person says, oh, I'm feeling tired today, let's not test this. It's too hard. The other person's more likely to say, no, no, we should really test that and do a good job. So that is how XP prevents programmers' uh, errors from getting into the system. It's not that they're perfect. It's that they're taking these small steps and have all these systems in place to catch the errors when they are made uh, rather than letting them sit in the software. Any questions about the material so far? Yes, uh, let's get the box over there. Took a favorable bet. If I can remember my question now. Um, you were showing. <laughs> You showed early on, during the video, you were running this over and over again. So what I'm wondering is, was that really a test that you would use again in the future, or is that just, you were just running it, but it wasn't a test you would preserve and carry forward? Yeah, so the question was, uh, well, I guess you could all hear the question because of a microphone. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, that's all right. Thank you, Timothy, getting your workout today. Uh, so yes, the, when, in test-driven development, you write tests. Those tests live forever. Uh, that said, in the refactor step, where you're looking at how to improve your software, 
not only do you pr improve the production code, you also improve the tests. And sometimes when you're going through that loop, you're not writing a new test, but you're modifying an existing test. Uh, the, there's a lot of guidance and, and information about how to do TDD well. Part of it is that the test should form, uh, a, should act as documentation of the behavior of the things that they're testing. So as you write them, you're going to be looking at how to make them better and better and act as better documentation. Uh, so that's what prevents it from, from becoming a mess. And over time, useless tests are retired or deleted. Did that answer your question? Next, we'll talk about defect-prone design. So Barry Beam says that 20% uh, of the modules in the system are responsible for 80% of the defects. So, and, and that rings true. That makes sort of intuitive sense to me. What can we do about those flawed designs? Well, in XP, it comes back to test-driven development. Uh, when you're doing this and you're writing your tests and you have such fine-grained tests, you have a lot of confidence in your ability to change your code without breaking anything. And we explicitly are going to stop to refactor. And again, refactoring is changing the design of the code without changing its behavior, uh, its externally visible behavior, whether the external is external to that particular module or to the program as a whole. Uh, changing the behavior of the code or the, the structure of the code without changing its behavior. We're explicitly going through and refactoring at every step. I'm going to play another video for you. This one is sped up 10 times. But what I want you to notice here is how the author of this code is constantly running the test as they refactor. And as they refactor, they're simplifying, uh, restructuring the code and also simplifying it. Every blue flash is a test run. So those test runs were probably about 20, 30 seconds apart. Uh, and each one of those was a small refactoring. And this is what XP, pro, uh, XP teams are expected to do when they're working on their code. They, it's called collective ownership. And it's the right and responsibility to make a change to any part of the code. Whenever you see an opportunity to improve the design, you're expected to take it. Now, there's some nuances there in terms of let's not go off and you know, gild the lily. I'm not going to talk about that right now. But there is this expectation that you're constantly improving the design when you see the opportunity. This was called merciless refactoring. Now, it happens at a small scale, as in that video, but it also happens at a larger scale. Not only as you go through this loop do you look at the code that you've just written and say, how can we improve it? You also are going to be looking at the bigger picture. And we're, when we're doing pairing or mobbing, that's what the people who aren't at the keyboard are thinking about. What's the bigger picture? Is this what we're building here appropriate for what we're trying to accomplish overall? Is the design clean? Is it easy to work with? So, uh, and what tends to happen is that you'll go through and you'll You'll uh, do the test-driven cycle several times, and then you'll sort of slow down and say, oh, I see a way to make this better. And then you'll speed up and go through it several more times, and then you'll slow down and do a series of refactorings. Eric Evans, in his fantastic book, Domain-Driven Design, called that a breakthrough. And in my experience, this happens at the class level, across the methods, or at the module level, depending on your programming language, across the methods or functions in a module. Uh, this happens every couple of hours. It happens across multiple classes, so making a, a substantial improvement to the way multiple classes interact every week or so for teams that are doing this merciless refactoring. And it happens at the architectural level every three to six months. Over time, one of my foundational experiences with XP uh, was not really trusting this idea of the merciless refactoring. And, uh, and working with a system that we thought was really well designed over the course of several months. And about six months into it, realizing, because we'd just done little changes, little changes, little simplifications, realizing, oh, there's a major refactoring we can do to the architecture that will set, substantially simplify this, make it much better, make it much easier for us to deal with some of the things that we need to deal with from a requirements perspective. And so that architectural refactoring is something that we embarked on. Those tend to take a while. Uh, they, 
you tend to never completely finish in architectural refactoring, so you don't want to be doing it all the time. But as you work in the system, you do come across these breakthroughs at the method level, the cross-class level, and even the architectural level. Taken to its extreme, you get what XP called evolutionary design. Evolutionary design is the idea that we are going to start with just what we need for today. We have a certain feature that we're building. We are going to create our design and our architecture for only that feature that we are building this week. And then, when we need something else, which we will because next week we're going to have new things that we're building, we will refactor and make our design a little less simple, a little more generic, a little more able to handle these new features and add that in. And we're going to do this in a way that allows us to build our soft, to evolve the design of our software indefinitely. I was really skeptical about this idea of evolutionary design when I first started with XP. I did not trust it. It seems silly. So for the first uh, XP project I worked on, we hedged our bets. We had, a, we had a project we were working on. It was a rewrite of an existing system. We thought we had the design and requirements down cold. And so we spent some time studying the literature. I read one of Martin Fowler's books. And uh, we got together and did the whole ivory tower design. We got together in a room, and we figured out what the design was going to be. And we came up with this beautiful uh, multi-layered architecture. And we implemented it. And then, like I said, over time, we refactored. And we realized that that design, although it was beautiful, was really complicated. It was overcomplicated. So we made it simpler. And then we made it simpler. And we made it simpler. And the design that we came up with with evolutionary design was actually far better than the one we came up with with the predictive upfront design. In fact, all the existing cruft from our overcomplicated design got in the way of refactoring to make it simpler and better. Uh, they, there were some things that we thought we needed that were just unneeded, and some things that we did need that we did wrong. And so we had to rip them out and replace them. And that was much worse than just putting them in in the first place would have been. So after that experience, I said, well, let me really embrace this idea of evolutionary design. What would happen if I did no design up front at all? Not, even, not big design up front, not small design up front, no design up front. Could that possibly work? And to my surprise, it worked really, really well. And so uh, that first XP project ended in 2001. I have been playing with this idea for nearly 20 years. And I have yet to come across a situation where it didn't work out. Now, it takes discipline, and it takes effort. And I've, I've solved some problems that people said couldn't be solved using this, like internationalization, uh, introducing business transactions into an application that didn't have business transactions. Um, I'm not going to go into those details right now. What I want to show you here in this video is a project I did as a, as a teaching exercise uh, in a screencast. Uh, where we did no upfront design. So uh, in the screencast, there was a, a, a desire to make an application. It was a retirement planning application, but there was no upfront design. And then as we did the screencast, I talked through how the, uh, uh, we just sort of did the design on camera as we went. But because this was a screencast with 15 minute videos, I checked in my code every 15 minutes. So I have a perfect record of how the design changed over time. And that's what I want to show you here. Every animation is at least 15 minutes. There wasn't always a design change at the end of every episode. Uh, every animation is at least 15 minutes. So this is how that design changed over time. And in the course of doing this, we tried some, some kind of quirky designs, because when you have the ability to refactor your design in any direction, which evolutionary design is about giving you that ability to refactor in, every, in any direction, uh, you can try weird ideas and see if they worked out. And we tried some kind of weird ideas about tell, don't ask uh, that worked out really well for us. The important thing about evolutionary design, though, is that when you work this way, because you're only building what you need today, you don't need to spend a lot of time building stuff that you think you might need in the future. 
You can build a really simple architecture, really simple design. Uh, we don't need to build the 20 microservices we think we might need in the future. We just build the one tiny, tiny little monolith and prepare to split out the microservices in the future. When you do this, you can ship sooner. Uh, there was a company that uh, called Rightly, you've probably never heard of it. They uh, wanted to make a word processor to, compu to compete with uh, Microsoft Word. Not necessarily the smartest idea in the world, but that was their idea. They shipped their first version after two weeks. Now, I don't have insight into their development process, but I assume they must have been using something like evolutionary design to ship a minimal word processor after two weeks. Now, why do you care about a, you know, a company trying to compete with Microsoft? Uh, they no longer exist. Who cares? Well, the reason they no longer exist is because they were bought by Google. Rightly is now called Google Docs. So that's how XP prevents defect-prone design, not by creating perfect design from the beginning because humans are incapable of perfection, but instead by making really simple small designs modifying them as they go, and constantly paying attention to how you can improve the design. Constantly saying it is your right and responsibility when you see a part of the design that's difficult to work with to make it better. So constantly bringing order to the chaos that leads to defects. Any questions about this? Let me toss you the box. So I had a question about a merciless refactoring. When you have a, a large number of unit tests that are fairly tightly coupled to the implementation, to the code, mm -hmm. and uh, you want to do a good-sized refactoring, then you're going to break potentially a ton of tests. So do you like put them on pause while you do the bigger refactoring, or how do you handle those larger increments with that dragging around, essentially, a big pile of unit tests? Yeah, that is a, a great question. Um, and the answer is not very satisfying. Uh, the answer is that if your tests are tightly coupled to the implementation of your code, you've written your test poorly. I see. Uh, and that's actually the subject of my, my workshop on Wednesday. Uh, it's yeah. called uh, Test Driven Development Without Mocks. Uh, it's not that mock, mock objects are bad. It's that the way most people use mocks is a little bit cargo culty. People are doing their tests kind of cargo culty, they're writing bad tests. They're using these, this mock object idea, for those of you who are familiar with it, to basically re-implement, say, my code has these five lines in it. <laughs> That's, it doesn't give you a lot of confidence right. in your code, and it makes your code really difficult to refactor. So the answer is uh, bad test design. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of people are doing this, which uh, we'll come back to in a minute. Uh, I have time for one more question on this section before we move on. Okay. So that's how we prevent uh, the uh, types of errors that programmers introduce. Either just a mistake at initial implementation or the types of designs that tend to produce bugs. But what if the programmers perfectly implement the wrong thing? What if they misunderstand what needs to be done in the first place? Well, before I answer this question, I want to play another game. And you should have now a, a handout. If you don't have a handout, raise your hand. We'll get one to you. Every row has a different handout, so don't show your handout to the people in the row above or below yours. What you're going to do is you're going to partner up with somebody in a different row because they don't see your handout. And you're going to write instructions. On your handout, there's a picture. Uh, some of you have a handout that has two pictures. Uh, use the one that's easier for this first exercise. Uh, so you have a picture on your handout. What I want you to do is on the top half, there's a picture. On the bottom half, there's a blank space. I want you to write in that blank space written instructions for reproducing that picture accurately, a requirements document. Use only words, no diagrams, because we're uh, the sort of a simplified example. 
And I'm going to give you five minutes. Now, find somebody in a row above your, your own or below your own to work with. What you're going to do is after you've written your requirements, you're going to exchange, hand, you're, you're going to tear off that bottom half and exchange. Uh, and they will take your instructions and they will try to reproduce the diagram based on your instructions alone and vice versa. I'll give you five minutes to write the instructions and then five minutes to try to reproduce uh, the original diagram and then we'll see how it worked out. If you have any questions, uh, raise your hand, I'll come around. Uh, we've got five minutes for this. Okay, hopefully you wrote the instructions on the bottom half of the page, so go ahead and tear off that bottom half. And the, what we've done is there's two handouts. It's uh, A, B, A, B, A, B. So find somebody in uh, an odd number, row, number of rows away from you. So above you, below you, three rows away uh, to exchange with. Uh, and they'll give you some instructions. On the back of their instructions, there should be a blank piece of uh, blank square. Go ahead and reproduce their diagram in that blank square. You're trading with somebody an odd number of rows away, so above or below you, or if there's nobody above or below you, then three rows away or five rows away. Does that make sense? Okay. So I'm going to give you five minutes to uh, read the instructions and reproduce the diagram. Okay. Yeah, there you go. And as you try to reproduce the diagram, there's no other communication allowed. Your requirements team has handed off the requirements to the software team and gone on vacation. Okay. Looks like everybody's done. A little bit early. Uh, so how'd you do? Go ahead and compare your outcome with the original uh, vision for the software. We're going to do this again. But the rules are different this time. Now, one of you had a sheet of paper with two pictures on it uh, on the back side. Uh, the other one had a blank, uh, blank square on the back side. For this second uh, version of the requirements game, you're going to work together. Uh, the person with a picture is going to keep it secret and describe verbally, words only, no gestures, no pointing, purely verbally with words, what they want to have happen. The other person is going to reproduce it in their blank square as they're talking, as the first person is talking. But you can ask questions as you go, and you can show your progress. You can say, is this what you meant? Or you can say, is, you mean here? You can point. The first person, you can't point, you can't gesture, you can only use words. We're going to give you at most five minutes for this. So work with the same person you did before. If uh, you need a new piece of paper, we've got them. Uh, good luck. OK. Um, so how'd you do? Was, uh, were the results this time higher or lower quality? Higher. higher. higher? Was it easier or harder? It was easier. It was, easier. Um, was it faster or slower? It was certainly less time. The first time I gave you 10 minutes, this time I gave you four minutes. Uh, well, because I didn't want to have half of you sitting around. Uh, it's the same number of person minutes overall, but it's a compressed schedule because you're working together rather than one person working, the other person waiting, and then the other person uh, working and the first people going on vacation. It also depends on what your uh, criteria for done is. Yeah, it also on what your criteria for done is. Uh, why was this second time easier, better quality results, and at least shorter cycle time than the first time. Immediate feedback. What was, the, sorry? Collaboration. Collaboration. Yeah, you'll notice a trend of feedback, collaboration, simplicity, courage, respect. These are the five core XP values. And you see it in the practices. Feedback, of course, being really important. This thing that we just did, this is the fundamental way that XP communicates requirements, in person, face to face. And for complicated domains, it's a significant investment. But it's not more work than traditional requirements. It's parallel work. It actually compresses the schedule because you don't have one group writing requirements, the other person, other group, uh, uh, then reading the requirements. 
Now, the team that I worked on that Michael Moss studied, one third of the team was dedicated to understanding and communicating requirements. Now, that is unusually high. This was a very complex domain where we were creating uh, software to work on mass spectrometers that are used by the drug industry, and the software we were creating identified metabolites. Don't ask me what metabolites were. That's why we had them. Uh, but one thing that I see is that a lot of teams these days don't make this kind of investment in making sure that you understand the requirements, uh, and uh, thus have to go back to the written requirements because they don't have the people on site. And so one of the things that people constantly ask me as an Agile coach is, can you teach us how to write stories better? No, I can't teach you how to write stories better. You're not supposed to write them down. The thing you write down is just a reminder for planning purposes. The way you communicate is this way, face to face. Now, for complicated problems, we do put examples on paper. We might put UI mockups. Uh, our UX designer on this team actually created this flash prototype that we used as a, as a living example of how the, how the UX was supposed to work. For the complicated chemistry questions, we, uh, we actually used a tool called Fit. Uh, Cucumber is the modern version of that uh, to create tables with lots of examples of given this metabolite data, this is what we should identify. Or given this sample data, this is the metabolites we should identify. You are going to have examples supplementing that face-to-face -face interaction. And we're also going to constantly review our work. Hey, we just finished this. What do you think? Just like you did in the exercise. Oh, so you want me to do what? Oh, put this there. OK, there's the line. Is this right? Customer review. And these are the ways. And then corrections are made right there on the spot. So that's how we prevented misunderstandings on these XP teams. On-site customers, they're called customers because they were representing the customer perspective or the user's perspective. Uh, written examples where necessary. That's not the primary form of communication. It's a supplement to the on-site customers. And then customer review as things are finished with immediate correction when mistakes are made. Sometimes you show them what, uh, what you've built and they say, yeah, that's exactly what I asked for. But now that I see it, it's not good enough. It doesn't work the way I thought it would. That happens. And that's OK. We expect that. And we love it. We love it when that happens, because now we're going to make the software better. So that's how we prevent misunderstandings. Any questions about this aspect? Watch out for your laptop. So how does this work for remote teams? Uh, for remote teams, uh, so we have this idea of team room. Um, and for remote teams, you need a virtual team room. So you need to have good tooling around, like Zoom. Uh, there's a tool called Miro, which is good for real-time uh, drawing and collaboration. Uh, and remote first tends to be better than partially remote, just because of human nature. Say that again. Uh, remote first, where everybody is expected to be remote. Uh, rather than having one person who's not in the room, that one person who's not in the room will always be excluded from the conversation. Uh, so if you're going to have a remote team, make everybody remote. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Yeah. So do you end up with a written pro a, ri a work product that covers the specification? Um, like the example we went through when we were talking through it, we didn't need to write anything down. All you had was the actual completed item. Isn't there value in having a specification at the end of it as well, a written spec for maybe a second version? Yeah, like absolutely. That? There is sometimes value. And if there is value, that is a business decision about putting the effort in to create that value. Uh, for the uh, chemical chemistry project that we were working on that for the FDA, there was a lot of value in providing a detailed specification of how the software worked for the purposes of FDA approval. Uh, there was conversation, I don't know if this ever happened, of taking our FIT documents, which were documents that were automatically checked against the software, and selling them, uh, and actually making that a source of revenue as well. Uh, so we had the FIT documents, which were sort of like a specification, could have been fleshed out in 
to a full specification. We did have a technical writer on the team. Um, but for something simpler like a brochureware website that's doing you know, forums or something like that, I don't know if it would be necessary. That is a business decision to make, not a technical decision to make. Did that answer your question? Yeah. OK, great. Can I get the box back? Where do the sign review fit in here? Can you hold it a little closer? I can't hear The you. sign reviews, where do they fit in here? The site reviews? The sign. Design yeah. reviews. Uh, there are no design reviews on the XP team. Instead, what we have is the uh, merciless refactoring, the pair program or, or mobbing, which acts as sort of a continuous design review. You're up, Timothy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we've got a good way of preventing programmer errors. We've got a good way of making sure that we build the right thing. That isn't all the types of errors that are possible. There are some things that we just never even realized could be a problem. And security is a great example of this. And uh, I particularly love, uh, it's not the only example, but it's the most fun. And there's this fantastic video, take a picture if you wanna, if you wanna watch it, about physical security. I wanna play you some excerpts uh, from this video. Now he's talking about physical penetration testing uh, in this talk. Another door, another water facility, right? Nice lock. I mean, I'm, I'm a decent enough picker. I'm not gonna try to pick this. Why not? Because boom, bad door fitment over and over and over. And like, you know, you don't want me in there. I don't belong in this room. <laughs> $5 hook gets me in when a nice lock could have prevented me if they had properly set the door up. Talk about another gap problem. Here's a locked door. There's some noise. And then Dr. Tran comes through like ninja in a cloud of smoke. This was late at night. This is a bank. The bank is closed. But I'm like, well, there is a rec sensor up there. And I had just kind of walked out of a bar with a drink. <laughs> So I just spit that through the door and like that works. So yeah, man, passive infrared doesn't understand hot, cold, it just says different. Oh, different must be a human. So yeah, blind spots. They had invested in a good lock. They've invested in high tech latches. They didn't fit the door properly. There was a gap. And then poof, all of that gone. Nobody knew. They had spent all this money on stuff that didn't matter. That cloud of smoke, by the way, that was not a high tech Security device, that was compressed air. That was to it. They just blew it through the gap in the door. So how do you prevent these blind spots? Well, professional testers are a really good idea. Professional testers, such as yourselves, have the experience and intuition to know where problems tend to arise. And you can use a technique, which I hope you've heard of, called exploratory testing, to take advantage of that experience and intuition to build your test plans and test the software at the same time based on what you find in the software. For example, let's say you've got a website that, has a that takes photos and you can upload a photo. Well, what happens if you upload a photo with a malformed header that says that the photo is a million pixels wide? What happens at that point? What happens if you upload a zero byte fo folder? What if you upload a zip file and it unzips it for you? And you upload a zip bomb. You ever heard of a zip bomb? This is a file, a specially crafted zip file that's very small that when expanded, uh, expands into petabytes and will blow up the server. You've got Unicode. What happens if you put in the byte, uh, what's the, the character reversing mark in Unicode and s suddenly uh, in your forums, some Yahoo puts this in, and then everybody else's text is either written vertically or backwards. These are the kinds of things that are blind spots that people don't think to fix in their software. Customers aren't going to ask for it until it happens. Programmers might not think of it. How do you find it? Testers using their experience and intuition and heuristics and checklists to say, well, these are the sorts of things that tend to be a problem. Now, once you find a bug, it's time to fix it really thoroughly. And this doesn't matter, is it, it doesn't matter if it's during exploratory testing or in the field. Any software that the, that the team, the whole team, which is the programmers and the on-site customers together, any software that they thought was done and perfect, 
If you find anything in that, either in the field or from uh, this exploratory testing or other, other QA efforts, now let's fix it thoroughly. That shouldn't have happened. So of course, what do we do? We write a unit test. We fix the code. But then we look at the design of our code and we say, what about our design allowed this to happen? Maybe one part of the system you upload a picture and it's fine, you, a bad picture. Another part of the system you upload a bad picture and it breaks. What's happened there? Duplication. You probably have two different ways of handling file uploads. So let's change our design so we only have one way of dealing with file uploads and then we'll fix the issues in that part of the system. Uh, similarly with Unicode or the other sorts of things that can go wrong. And then let's look at the process. Let's do root cause analysis. That, uh, that story I told you about Nancy Van Turendevert, that wasn't a, an experience report from Nancy saying, look how great we were. That was an experience report saying, we had a bunch of newbies. Here's what we learned when we did root cause analysis on every single defect. Because when you only have a couple dozen or 50 defects, you can, if you're only getting two a month, you can do root cause analysis on every defect. Say, what about our systems, processes, and habits allowed this issue to occur in the first place? It's not the people. We're not going to say, Joe screwed up. Because if it's the people, you know it and you got rid of them already. Thank you. And once you've, fixed, once you've looked at how you can fix the process, oh, are we just not aware of how Unicode can go wrong? Let's get some Unicode training. Maybe we need some general security training. Whatever it is, once you've done that, now you probably have similar errors in the rest of your system. So what else, can you go, what else could be wrong? Do further exploratory testing around that. Investigate those issues uh, further. When you put this all together, you end up with something that uh, these XP teams had, and the few that remain still have, that kind of rubs people the wrong way. It's a, it's a bit of smugness. It's a bit of eliteness. It's a kind of an attitude. And that, you know, we're not going to have bugs. That's going to be for other people. And one of the ways this comes through is that when we get a bug, we don't put it in the bug freezer for later to ferment and get ugly. We don't have bug databases. Now, if we are working with a legacy system, there's probably a bug database that we'll have to chip through. But anything new that comes along, we are shocked and dismayed, and we fix it immediately. We do root cause analysis on, on it immediately. There may be some desire for bookkeeping uh, that we'll track, but we do not keep a list of things to fix later. We fix it now. And that's how we prevent systemic blind spots. Exploratory testing to find the blind spots, root cause analysis and fixing the design to fix the blind spots, and an attitude that bugs are not what we do here. So we're not going to save them for later. We're going to fix all of our issues now or we are going to decide from a business perspective that it does not make sense for us to support IE6. It doesn't work on IE6? Fine. I have time for one or two questions about this topic. Okay. Oh, yeah. What is your recommendation for how to maybe communicate to product the need, especially with like if you're doing something with a product owner is approving what's being done, the need to fix these things right away? Because, I mean, occasionally, like last week I found a bug that was serious enough to put in the sprint. But most of the time when I find bugs, it's not fixed right away. It's like, oh, this is fine. You know, it, it's like, you know hardly a big deal, let's just wait, and then just wait turns into it isn't fixed. Yeah, so, yeah, so uh, <laughs> how do we convince product managers to fix right away? I think you hit on it. Uh, just wait turns into it isn't fixed. So uh, on these XP teams, we make a choice on every bug. Fix, don't fix. There is no later. Uh, if it's something worth fixing, it probably reflects some flaws in the design that are slowing us down and resulting in other defects. Fixing it now will be cheaper than fixing more, more bugs later. 
If there's a decision that it's not worth fixing, then that's fine. Either way, let's get that mental burden off our plate. Uh, okay. And how do we convince them? Well, this is just one of the rules about how XP works. It's a decision that people make when they decide to work in this way. Um, how do you get people to do this? It's a whole other topic, <laughs> uh, which, um, which we'll get into in a little bit. That we'll get into a tiny little bit. However, there is a book that I can recommend called Fearless Change by Mary Lynn Manns and Linda Rising, and a sequel called More Fearless Change, how you can encourage, you know, create change in an organization. Uh, Esther Derby has also very recently came up, come out with a book about creating change in organizations. I don't remember the title, but the, the name of the author is Esther Derby, E-S-T-H-E-R-D-E-R-B-Y. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank Great, you. Thank you. All right. So put this all together, and now we have the ability to adapt our plans. We have simple designs without a lot of inertia, high quality code with automated tests, and decision makers on site to generate new insights and react to those changes. So now we can embrace change, which is why XP was created in the first place. It was not actually created as a way of creating high quality software. It was created as a way of giving product managers the ability to change their mind. Because in the 90s, when Agile was invented, we had these change control boards whose entire purpose was to say no to change. <laughs> Those of you who lived it know what I'm talking about. Uh, and software products with multi-year life cycles where at the end they delivered exactly what they were asked to and it wasn't, one, wasn't what people wanted anymore. So XP was created to give you the ability to make changes. So now you can have true business agility. You can surf the wave of possibility. You can experiment with ideas. Some of them will be wrong. Some of them will be right. Some of them will be good. Some of them will be bad. We've got the folks on site to get as closest to the maximum value that we can get in our software and reach the best outcomes. So to wrap up, we have all these, uh, we, we have all these examples of XP teams achieving impressive results. It's not automatic, though. It takes care and it takes discipline. We prevent programmer errors through test-driven development, continuous code review, and energized work by making sure that people are rested, not working tired. We prevent defect-prone designs by creating the simplest thing we can and evolving it to become more complicated only when needed and constantly paying attention to improving design quality. We prevent misunderstandings by having our customers or our customer representatives on site to talk with us in a, that very effective face-to-face -face communication, supplementing it with examples and review. And we prevent blind spots by conducting exploratory testing, doing root cause analysis of every bug because we just don't have that many bugs and we don't store them in the database. We fix them or we say they're not ever worth fixing. This is a really rigorous approach to quality that hardly anybody uses. And the takeaway I have here, the, the hope I have here, is that by sharing this with you, a bunch of people who I hope are quality obsessed, somebody's got to bring this back. And I'm hoping that maybe you will be the folks to do it. Yes, this is a way of developing software without a lot of QA in the teams, but that's okay, you're completely outnumbered anyway, right? Exploratory testing is a really good use of QA folks in this environment. Uh, the uh, customer examples is another good use of QA in this environment because uh, the customers left to their own devices will not think of anything other than the happy path, and maybe not even all of those. But more than that, more than anything else, is a need to evangelize these ideas and bring uh, these really rigorous agile ideas, the beginnings of agile, that have com completely forgotten, have been overridden by the cargo cults back in the mainstream. And that is my request for you. I'm James Shore. You can find me uh, at James Shore on Twitter. On the web my website is jameshore.com. This has been Agile Without Dedicated QA. Thank you for coming.